Welcome. This is the first video in my introduction to model theory. My name is Manuel Budiaski. I teach this course at Technical University Dresden. Model theory is a branch of logic, with many applications in other areas of mathematics, in particular in algebra and in theoretical computer science. In this course, we will also see many links with the theory of infinite permutation groups. Model theory often uses results from combinatorics, such as Ramsey's theorem. And for some topics in model theory, a bit of set theory is needed. One of the general goals of model theory is to understand the class of all models of a given first order theory T. Recall, a first order theory is just a set of first order sentences. For example, the theory of groups or the theory of rings or the first order theory of one of your favorite structures. For simplicity, I assume throughout the video that T has a countable signature. A concrete and fundamental question that one can ask about the class of all models of T is how many models of some fixed cardinality kappa are there? If we count models, of course, we actually want to count isomorphism classes of models. So isomorphic models should only be counted once. For example, if we look at the first order theory of some finite graph with five vertices here, for example, then there is one model of size five and all other models must be isomorphic to this model because with first order sentences, we can completely describe the isomorphism type of our finite graph. In the following, IT kappa denotes the number of isomorphism types of models of T of cardinality kappa. This function is sometimes called the spectrum of T. So IT aleph zero is the number of countable models of T. And by what we've observed, the number of countable models of the theory of some finite structure, for example, is zero. Now let's have a look at something more interesting. Let's look at the first order theory of the integers with the successor relation. The first order theory of this structure contains, for example, the sentence that states that every element has a unique successor and a unique predecessor. By definition, we have at least one countable model of this theory, but there are also countable models that are not isomorphic to the model we started with. For example, we can form a disjoint union of two isomorphic copies of the original model. In the resulting structure, it is still true that every element has a unique successor and a unique predecessor, and it is still countable, but clearly the two structures are not isomorphic. To work out the details of all, this is a good exercise. My next two examples will be treated explicitly later in the course. I present them here as facts, without proofs. The first is that the theory of the order of the rationals has exactly one countable model. So first order logic describes this structure uniquely up to isomorphism. The second is the other extreme, the first order theory of the rational numbers with addition and a strict order has continuum many, that is two to the aleph zero many countable models. Note by our assumption that the signature is countable. This is the maximum possible. There are only two to the aleph zero many countable structures with a countable signature. I will now mention some famous results in this context and a famous open research problem. Let T be a complete theory over a countable signature. Watt's theorem states that T can't have exactly two countable models up to isomorphism. Exactly one is possible, as we have seen, but not two. Morley proved that if T has infinitely many countable models, then there are either countably many models or continuum many, or perhaps Aleph one many countable models. Aleph 1 is the smallest uncountable cardinal, and if the continuum hypothesis does not hold, then this is a different cardinal than 2 to the Aleph 0. Now, Watt's conjecture, which is still open, states that we can remove Aleph 1 from the statement. So it states that as soon as we have uncountably many countable models, we have continuum many countable models. The first theorem that we will prove in this course is the theorem of Löwenheim and Skolem. The theorem of Löwenheim and Skolem states that if T has an infinite model, then it also has a model in every infinite cardinality. 
Note that this statement has implicitly two parts. There is Löwenheim's Golem upwards and Löwenheim's Golem downwards. Let me explain. We have the well-ordered cardinals, Aleph 0, Aleph 1, and so on. Now suppose we are given some infinite model of t, of some cardinality. Then we have the task to construct larger models of t, and we have the task to construct smaller models in order to prove the theorem of Löwenheim and Skolem. To do this, we need to apply a couple of fundamental techniques in model theory that we need all the time later. In particular, we will introduce elementary chains, limits of elementary chains and limits of chains. We also need the compactness theorem of first order logic. If you haven't encountered the compactness theorem before, don't worry. We will also prove the compactness theorem. Our proof of the compactness theorem is based on the beautiful ultra product construction. To define chains, we need a linearly ordered index set i and a sequence of structures with the same signature indexed by i. Such a sequence is called a chain if for i smaller than j, ai is a substructure of aj. So the chain in fact looks like an onion. A union of a chain is the whole thing, viewed as a structure. Formally, it is the structure with the same signature as the structures in the chain, whose domain is the union of all the domains of the structures in the chain. And where a tuple is in one of the relations, if for some index i, the tuple is in the corresponding relation in the ith structure of the chain. Note that if the index set is well ordered, then this is equivalent to saying that the tuple is in the relation for all but finitely many indices. If the signature contains function symbols, the definition of limits is similar. We have to look at an example. The example I will show you is quite instructive. Uh, it will show up uh, two times in this video. Let ai be the structure with domain minus i, minus i plus 1, minus i plus 2, and so on. So all integers that are larger than minus i, minus i included. There is only one binary relation in our structure, namely the usual ordering on the integers. Note that for every i, the first order theory of a i equals the first order theory of a zero. So all the structures in the chain satisfy exactly the same first order sentences. The reason is that all the structures are even isomorphic. However, the first order theory of the limit of the chain has a different first order theory. The reason is that in the limit, there is no smallest element, which is a property that can be expressed by a first order sentence. So for this chain, in the transition to the limit, we change the first order theory. We would like to work with chains that are better behaved in this respect. This is the motivation for the definition of elementary chains. First, we need to define elementary embeddings. Let A and B be structures with the same signature. And let phi be a first order formula with uh, three variables x1 up to xn over this signature. We say that a function from the domain of A to the domain of B preserves phi if all elements a1 up to an of A, if these elements satisfy phi in A, then the image of these elements under f satisfy phi in B. f is called elementary if it preserves all first-order formulas. We already know what substructures and extensions are. Now we define elementary substructures and elementary extensions. Suppose that A is a substructure of B. If the identity map from A to B is elementary, we write A prec B and call A an elementary substructure of B and B an elementary extension of A. Note that if A is an elementary substructure of B, then A and B in particular have the same first order theory. The converse need not be true. In our previous example, we had that A0 and A1 have the same first order theory, but A0 is not 
an elementary substructure of A1. To see this, consider the formula phi with uh, one free variable, x, which states that x is a smallest element. This formula holds for zero in the structure A0, but it does not hold in A1. So the identity map from A0 to A1 does not preserve this formula. So the identity map is an embedding, but not an elementary embedding. A chain, AI, is called an elementary chain if AI is an elementary substructure of AJ for all i smaller j. Tarski's elementary chain lemma, or, or sometimes also called tarski wort lemma, states that for elementary chains, the transition to the limit is smooth in the sense that every AI is an elementary substructure of the limit. In particular, the limit will have the same first order theory as the structures of the elementary chain. Let's sketch the proof of this lemma. It is by induction over the shape of first order formulas. For atomic first order formulas, this is immediate, already from the fact that AI is a substructure of the limit. If phi is of the form not psi, or if phi is of the form psi and uh, psi 1 and psi 2, then the statement follows immediately from the inductive assumption. It is really the existential quantifier that is interesting here. Let's assume that phi is of the form exists an x psi. If phi holds in AI, then it clearly holds in the limit as well. Because the witness for x in AI is also an element of the limit, so this direction is trivial. For the other direction, suppose phi holds in the limit. Now the witness for x might not be an element of AI. However, the witness is an element of AJ, for some j, by the definition of the, the limit. AJ does satisfy phi. But AJ is an elementary extension of AI. So AI also satisfies phi. And this concludes the proof. In the proof of the downwards Löwenheim Skolem theorem, we need a lemma that is somehow similar. It is called Tarski's test. It is a test whether a certain subset of the domain of a structure is the domain of an elementary substructure. So we have a structure B and a subset of the domain of B. The lemma says that A is the domain of an elementary substructure of B if and only if every formula phi that might also involve constants from A and is satisfiable in the expansion of B by those constants can also be satisfied by an element of A. So slowly again with a picture. We have B and we have the subset A. And we require that if some formula is satisfiable in B, then it is already satisfiable in A. But the important thing is that our formula might talk about all the elements of A because we have expanded the structures so that they have constants for all elements of A. Now the forward implication in this test is immediate. For the converse, the proof is almost the same as before. It's a structural induction over the shape of first order formulas and we leave it to the audience. Finally, we can prove Löwenheim Skolem downwards. Let B be a structure and let S be a subset of the domain of B. We will show that B has an elementary substructure, A, whose domain contains S and such that it has cardinality at most the size of S, but at least countable. So if S is finite, then A is still allowed to be infinite. In our proof, we construct a chain. We start with S and define the elements of the chain as one, as two, and so on inductively. Suppose that SI is already defined. To define SI plus one, we look at all formulas phi with only one free variable x, which are satisfiable in B. 
the formula might contain constants from Si. Since the formula is satisfiable in B, we can choose a witness for X in B. Let's call the witness A sub phi. B satisfies phi of A sub phi. And now Si plus 1 contains Si together with all these witnesses for all formulas phi. And in this way we repeat, repeat, constructing our chain. My first claim is that the union A of all the Si is an elementary substructure of B. And this is precisely the purpose of Tusky's test. So let's have a look at an illustration. We have a B, we have the subset S. Now we construct our onion by including witnesses for formulas. We have to verify that the union A of the sets we have constructed satisfies the assumptions from Tarski's test. So we have some formula which might use constants from A and which is satisfiable in B. Then there will be a layer in our onion that contains all the finitely many constants that we use in this formula. And this means that on the next layer of the onion, we have added a witness for this formula. So the onion contains the witness. And this is precisely what we need for Tarski's test. My next claim is that the union A of all the SI has at most the cardinality of S, unless S is finite, in which case A is countable. This is an easy calculation. Each layer has at least the size of S. And then we prove by induction that each layer has size at most max of the size of S and aleph zero. This is because of our assumption that the signature is countable, because then there are only that many formulas. So we added only that many witnesses and we have countably many layers, but countable times kappa equals kappa for every cardinal kappa. And this shows the claim. The upwards Löwenheim Skolem theorem is an easy consequence of the compactness theorem. So we will defer this to the next video about compactness. I will explain the idea of this uh, chain construction again with an example. We consider the structure of the linearly ordered real numbers. This structure has cardinality 2 to the aleph 0. We would like to construct a countable model with the same first order theory. In this example, you might see the countable model immediately. But the point here is that I would like to illustrate the idea of the proof of the downwards Löwenheim Skolem theorem with this example. We first fix arbitrarily some countable subset. Suppose we start with Z, the integers. Now, the integers do not have the same first order theory as the reals with respect to the linear order. For example, the reals are dense while the integers are not. And this is a first order property. In the first step of the construction, we look at formulas with one free variable that might involve some constants from Z. For example, the formula 0 is smaller x and x is smaller 1. This is a formula that is satisfied in B, but not in Z. So to the next level in the construction, we add a witness for x. For example, 1 half. We could have added 2 thirds, doesn't matter. And as we do for all first order formulas, there are only countably many, since our signature is countable. And then we repeat the entire thing infinitely often. And our proof shows that at the end, we arrive at the countable elementary substructure of B, which means in particular that this substructure has the same first order theory as the structure we started with. 